Thank you for the invitation. Thank you everyone for coming to listen. Today, I will tell you a little bit about natural products. And so natural products are small molecules that are made by a variety of different organisms. So these are probably some natural products that you've all seen. So for example, morphine, penicillins, tetracycline. And so cyanobacteria also produce a range of varied natural products. And so just for example, cryptophysin, uh, it's an anti-cancer molecule. Saxitoxin, which is what I did my PhD on, this is a neurotoxin, and hopefully one day might be able to be used as an anesthetic also. Cytonemin, which is a UV-absorbing molecule. Or you can have other molecules where you have similar structures, uh, such as the ambiguines, but with different bioactivities. And so natural products are important because about 50% of chemotherapeutics are natural products, uh, all natural products are derived. And so just in general, it's the aim of the field to try and identify novel natural products, which will have new structures and therefore might have new bioactivities. And so traditionally, natural products were discovered using this top-down approach, uh, also known as this classical approach, but it's still widely used and still widely successful. So the advantage of this method is that you don't really need to know a lot about the organism. So you don't need a genome, you just need to be able to grow it in large scale. And so how this method works is that you go out to the environment, you collect a sample somewhere, it can isolate the bacteria from this sample. This will then give you your isolated microorganism. You can then grow this up into large scale cultures, extract all the natural products using solvents. So then you have your pool of natural products. You can test this against a series of bioassays for whatever bioassay that you might be interested in. And then from this, isolate your compound of interest. Once you have your compound, your structure, you can then also try and identify the genes. While this is a very good method, it does have some drawbacks, especially in regards to cyanobacteria, because most of us know that cyanobacteria grow very slowly. The amount of products produced is usually very small. So sometimes you might need to produce like two to 10 or 100 liters of culture to get a few milligrams or a gram of compound. And so, you know, as you can imagine, this is not very practical in all cases. Also, sometimes it suffers from high rediscovery rates. The problem is, is that once you get to your isolated compound, you've gone through a lot of the process. And once you get to this point, you might discover that the compound is already known. And lastly, you can only identify compounds that are actively produced under the growth conditions. So you might have a bacteria and it produces the greatest natural products ever, but if it doesn't actually produce it during your culture, then you'll never be able to identify it. More recently, there's been this rise of microbial genomics, and this has mainly been spurred by the decrease in sequencing cost. And along with this increase in sequencing, we've also had the development of bioinformatic tools such as AntiSmash. And so what AntiSmash does is to screen a genome sequence to look for biosynthetic gene cluster. And so these are the genes that are responsible for producing the natural product. The other advantage of this method is that you can also dereplicate at the genetic level. So you can look at the biosynthetic genes and predict what the structure might be at the end. And from this, you can more easily target novel molecules. Also, along with these genome sequencing and bioinformatic tools, one of the things that has become apparent is that many genomes, or almost all genomes, encode many, many more biosynthetic gene clusters than there are identified natural products. And so the classic example of this is Streptomyces coelicolor. This organism, it was studied for 50 years. It was known to be a natural product producing organism. However, once they sequenced the genome, they found that there was about 10 times more biosynthetic gene clusters than there were known natural products. These biosynthetic gene clusters that are not actively producing anything, these are known as silent pathways or cryptic pathways, gene clusters where a product or a known product isn't linked to that pathway. And so it's thought that about 80 to 90% of biosynthetic gene clusters within a genome are silent or cryptic. And so that means these are really, you know, huge resources that are capable of producing unknown molecules. Now with AntiSmash, we have huge lists of cryptic biosynthetic gene clusters. And so what I think really the bottleneck in the field is trying to link these biosynthetic gene clusters with its encoded natural product uh, to experimentally do this. And so this is what takes lots of time. It's not so easy. And so this is the problem that we tried to address. But to do this, I guess there's a few ways, but one of the ways that we focus on is to capture the biosynthetic gene cluster from the genome of the producing organism, and then to place it inside another organism, a heterologous host, to activate the genes, and then to see what has been encoded. And so just in general, there's two different types of methods to do this. Uh, so you have these in vivo approaches, such as homologous recombination. 
and these include TAR or linear linear homologous recombination, or we have in vitro methods. And most of these revolve around PCR. From this, we develop this direct pathway cloning strategy of capturing pathways. So how this works, DIPAC revolves around long amplification PCR. And so we're talking PCR products that are about 25, 26 KB. This is the maximum size I've got at the moment. Uh, and so PCR is used to generate linear pieces of DNA. These linear pieces of DNA at the terminal ends then have homology sequences, which are introduced on the primer. For example, here we have this biostatic gene cluster in the center. This is our gene cluster of interest. You can either amplify it in its native arrangement, like at the top, or you can specifically amplify certain parts of the cluster using some kind of rational design. So for example, here we want to amplify this part, but we want to remove this gene in black, and then we want to amplify this other section and turn it around so that it forms an operon. And by using PCR and just designing the cloning, we can very simply do this. So once we have all our linear pieces of DNA, we then use DNA assemblies such as Gibson assembly or SLIC to assemble all the pieces of DNA together within an expression vector. We then transform this into a heterologous host, so most commonly E. coli. We then express the pathway, and if you're lucky, then you then have a peak, which is the new compound. And so, well, I, you know, I like this method and I think it's very good. Of course, it's not the perfect method in every situation. There's several things that you need to consider when trying to decide whether you should use this or not. And in particular, the cluster size. So, you know, of course, it's based on PCR. It's best for these small to mid-sized clusters. The longest we've had at the moment is about 55 KB. So if you have like 100 or 150 KB size gene cluster, then obviously this might not be a good method to use. Also, how simple or complex the genetic organization of the cluster is. So you need to predict whether there's regulatory elements that, for example, might affect transcription. And this is something you need to take into account. What I think is the most important thing is how related the source organism is to the heterologous host. And so basically what this is asking is how confident are you that your native promoters will work in the heterologous host? And so this is really, really important for cyanobacteria because at least in my experience, cyanobacterial promoters never seem to work in E. coli. They always have lots of problems. And so this is something that you can then address right at the start of the cloning. And so I think as we continue to move towards these poorly characterized strains and source organisms that are more phylogenetically distinct, then this is also something that we'll more often need to take into account. But then if you do decide to use this method, I think it comes with several advantages. So for example, because it's based on PCR, you only need small amounts of DNA. The in vitro setup, once you have all your linear pieces of DNA, then this is quick and easy. So, you know, 10 to 60 minutes. Because it's all designed on PCR and primer design, you can be very, very specific or you have a very high precision to the nucleotide on what parts you want to capture and remove. So for example, you don't have to rely on restriction enzymes or anything like this. You can clone directly into any expression vector. So for example, if you need inducible promoters or integration vectors, you can do this during the cloning step. And what I think is the most important is that you can perform this refactoring uh, without additional antibody cassettes. So for example, you can exchange the promoters, you can swap genes, do knockouts. And so I'll give a few examples of these soon. Our expression vector that we mostly use is this one. And so this is based on PET28B, it's a medium copy plasmid. So what I did was to remove the T7 promoter and replace it with the PTETO promoter, which is tetracycline inducible. And so the PTETO promoter has a much lower strength of transcription. I think this is really important in expressing these long pathways. We have examples where we've tried to express the same pathway with the T7 promoter and the PTETO, and the T7 really struggles. And I think it's just because the expression is way too strong. It's not designed for expressing pathways. What I did then was to insert GFP here. And so therefore the insert site is just upstream of GFP and downstream of the promoter. The idea here is that you insert your genes just upstream of GFP, and that way we have a reporter system that once you've done your expression, you can then check the cell pellet for GFP, and if you see it, from this you then know that at least you had successful transcription across your insert and then through GFP. Yeah, I think this helps a lot, especially if you don't get expression, because transcription is one of the biggest problems. What we're working on now is to make some additional vectors. So for example, this PET28B can only handle up to about 25 KB in total. So we want to swap the backbone for PCC1 FOS, which can handle much larger inserts, and also to replace the origin of replication so that we can also perform co-expression experiments. 
So now I will talk about my first example, which was the Hapalosin biosynthetic gene cluster. Hapalosin is a known molecule that was identified back in the 80s. And then the biosynthetic gene cluster is something that I worked on back in Australia. Hapalosin itself, it reverses chemotherapy-induced multiple drug resistance. The biosynthesis occurs by an NRPS-PKS system. The most important thing about it, I would say, is that it has this unusual adenylation ketoreductase diadomain. And so this incorporates an alpha keto acid, not an amino acid. When we look at the cluster, it's present in multiple cyanobacteria, such as Fischerella, Hapalosiphon. And the nucleotide sequence is almost identical in all of these strains. However, if we look at the gene annotations, so particularly in HAPD, the open reading frames are annotated differently. So I think in Fischerella, the start codon is this TTG, and then about 160 base pairs downstream, you have the open reading frame being predicted to start in a different organism at this shorter ATG. So we thought DIPAC was a good opportunity, and this could be a good example with the ability to amplify different parts of the cluster to then investigate what the real open reading frame or the real start position might be. And so to do this, the first thing we did was to look for transcriptional terminators, because these, of course, will stop the transcription in your expression vector. And so we found one here, just in the intergenic region between HAP A and HAP B. And so we had to remove this. So the first thing I did was to clone HAP A as a single gene to get our first intermediate vector. I then amplified HAP B and HAP E as a single PCR product, so 23KB, and then inserted this just downstream of HAP A. And so this removed the transcriptional terminator. This then was our first expression vector. The next thing I did was to then amplify HAP B and C as a single PCR product, inserted this downstream of HAP A, to get a second intermediate vector and then amplify HAPD and HAPE. So where I started the PCR product is the shorter open reading frame of HAPD. So then that way we deleted this intergenic region as well as the larger open reading frame. Inserted this downstream of C to get our second expression vector. So these are identical except for the starting region of HAPD. So we then transformed these into E. coli BAP1 we induced with 0.5 microgram a mil of tetracycline for five days at 20 degrees, and then extracted these and tested by LCMS. And so if we look at the LCMS results, so with our empty vector, which is our control, we don't see hapalosin at all, as expected. With our full-length HAPD expression vector, we are able to identify hapalosin. And then in our other expression vector, we also don't see any product. So from this, we know that the larger open reading frame, the TTG start codon is essential for biosynthesis, and this must be the real start codon. This will bring me to uh, the second project, Cyanobacterin. So we've been working on this on quite a few years now, and we're very happy to present it. So Cyanobacterin is this small little molecule here. And so I worked on this in collaboration with Dr. Katarina Seal, and this was in Munich. So Katarina was in the group of Professor Dr. Tanya Gulda. And so Katarina was interested in halogenases. And so she found this molecule and we decided to try and find the halogenase that might be responsible for this reaction here. And so a little bit about cyanobacterin was the first chlorinated natural product identified from fresh water. So back in 1982. So it was found quite a long time ago. It has phytotoxic activity. So it inhibits photosynthetic electron transport. And as you can see, it's an unusual structure. And so the biosynthesis remained unsolved for a very long time. This is then what we wanted to try and look at as well. As I mentioned, the molecule halogenated. First thing we did is to look for halogenases within the genome. And so we found two. And one of them was associated with an already identified pathway. And the other one was here. But this was actually annotated as an oxidoreductase, uh, not a halogenase. And so what Katarina did was to take the sequence and she performed some alignments with known halogenases. And so from this, she was able to predict that this gene is actually a real halogenase. When we looked at the genes surrounding this gene here, we found some genes that might possibly be involved in producing some of these little tailoring reactions. So for example, we had two O-methyltransferases. And so perhaps one is methylated in here and one is methylated in here. We found some tyrosine-related enzymes, and so we thought possibly this could be tyrosine or this could be tyrosine. Uh, but in the end, we really had no idea if these genes were actually responsible for producing cyanobacterium. Basically, our approach was to just clone these genes, express them, and see what they're making. And so this is what we did. First, I cloned this as one single piece, captured this. And we then found two transcriptional terminators, which were either side of uh, CIPH, and so we had to remove these. 
And so basically I removed all the intergenic regions between all these genes to get our final expression vector. I then transformed this into E. coli again and expressed exactly like I mentioned before. And so when we looked at the HPLC, this is what we found. So compared to the empty vector, we had these four new peaks. We isolated each peak and then determined the structure. And so we found three different molecules. Our molecule A is in peak one and two, molecule two is in peak two and three, and molecule three is at the end. And the reason why each of these molecules has two peaks is because you get a cis-trans isomer at the double bond here, but there's only actually three molecules. And now when we look at these compared to cyanobacterin, we can see, of course, the molecules are not exactly the same, but this core part of the structure is identical. It's just these tailorings that are absent. So we were confident that these genes were actually making cyanobacterin. It's just our heterologous host wasn't performing these final tailoring reactions. Now we know we have the genes, but we still have no idea what is really making this. And so, as I said before, we thought that this might be a tyrosine and this might be tyrosine. Perhaps this was valine. So we fed carbon labeled tyrosine and valine to our expression cultures. And this is what we found. So in the valine, we found a plus four in the mass. And so this corresponded to incorporation of valine here. And then in our tyrosine expression cultures, we found a plus eight, a plus nine, and a plus 17 shift in mass. And so this corresponded to one tyrosine, two tyrosines, and both tyrosines. So at least now we knew the building blocks that are required for the biosynthesis. But we still had no idea kind of how these were all getting joined together. So our next approach was to then perform some knockouts and to try and work out which genes are actually performing these reactions. This slide is just an example for how I did all the knockouts. And so I think this can be applied in you know, many other situations too. And so just basically in general, what you do is to just select the gene that you want to knock out. In this case, gene I in red, select the gene that's next to it, design outward facing primers, which flank these two genes. You can then amplify the vector backbone with this then amplify that second gene and just use this as the insert. And so from this, we were very, very quickly in parallel, able to perform many knockouts, as I said, without antibiotic resistance. This took us a few days. So this was pretty cool, I think. Anyway, we have all our knockouts. We mainly focused on these four genes, C, E, F, and G. And this was mainly because these are the four that we really couldn't predict the function. And so this is where we wanted to start. If you look at the top chromatogram, this is the control. These are cyanobacterin-like molecules. And then in our C knockout, our E and our F, we completely abolished production, while in G, the production remained active. So therefore, we knew now that these three genes, C, E, and F, must be essential for the biosynthesis. So the next thing we did, of course, is to then just clone these three genes and express them and see what it's making. And so it wasn't making the final molecule, but it was making this little peak here. And we were able to work out the structure of this. And so this consisted of part of the tyrosine and part of the valine. So at least we knew that these three genes now were making one of the building blocks or, or part of the molecules, an intermediate. But we wanted to know what's the final gene involved. While here I'm showing one gene, we actually cloned several genes and expressed them all to see which one would be making that final step. And it turned out the last gene required and so we had now our minimal gene cluster expression vector with C, E, F, and B. And this then made our molecule from our heterologous expressions. So with all this in mind, we then now had our minimal gene cluster. And so we cloned each of these four enzymes individually and then performed each of the reactions in vitro. These are what we know are needed. So we have an ammonia lyase, a long chain acyl-CoA synthetase, a TPP binding enzyme, and this three oxoacyl ACP synthase. When we took the first two genes, so we realized that tyrosine uh, is then converted to 4-cumeric acid. 4-cumeric acid is then converted to 4-cumeral-CoA. And so we couldn't actually get CIP-C to work in vitro. I'm not sure why. So it works in our heterologous expressions, but in vitro, we could never get it to work. So instead, we use this homologous enzyme, 4-CO1, and this is a well-known enzyme, very well characterized. And so this was able to be used as a replacement. So now we had our first substrate. Next, we realized that CIP-E, the TPP-dependent enzyme, so this works very, very similar to cytonemin biosynthesis. And so what happens here is that a valine is converted to alpha-ketoisovaleric acid. And so this occurs by transaminases, which are just present in E. coli and in cyanobacteria, but not part of the pathway. 
tyrosine is also converted by the transaminases to 4-hydroxyphenylpyruvic acid. CIP e will then take both of these molecules and perform the first CC bond. And so with this, we then have our two building blocks for cyanobacterin, and we have one gene left. And so CIP f now will take both of these building blocks and will perform the final ring formation. And so this is the first time we found an enzyme that can really do anything like this. And so this was super exciting. From this, we've then renamed this enzyme furanolide synthase. And so now our work in the future, of course, is to then you know, look for more of these pathways throughout cyanobacteria to see what they might be producing. So we have many of these pathways cloned at the moment. We have many structures from these. And so these are all different to cyanobacterin. So some of them we have the structures already identified and some of them we have the pathways cloned and we're identifying the structures at the moment. The other thing that we're working on is to use our in vitro system to feed different substrates and to generate analogous molecules. So for example, this is our normal biosynthesis. If you feed different cinnamic acids, these are easily incorporated with small changes, for example, here and here. Or we can feed different alpha keto acids, such as these, or phenylpyruvate, and these get incorporated as well. So these are all molecules that we've generated using this system already. And so, yeah, we have a lot more work coming out on this. And so this is the end of this project. And so lastly, I'd like to talk about what I plan to work on in the future with DIPAC, particularly symbiotic cyanobacteria. Cyanobacteria, the amazing little organisms that they are, can also form a symbiosis with a range of hosts. So these include lichens, plants, such as cycads, moss, or in the marine environments, dinoflagellates, animals. And so it's their function mainly to produce nitrogen and carbon to the symbiotic partner. And so this means that they're sharing metabolites. And this then gives the potential for them to also be sharing natural products. And so in general, symbiotic organisms from non cyanobacteria from other organisms, they are known to produce very specific natural products that are not found in free living systems. And so we think that symbiotic cyanobacteria will be the same. So what kind of cyanobacteria are known to form symbiosis? So both are filamentous and unicellular. However, Nostoc is by far the most commonly investigated. I'm sorry, I know this tree might be a bit difficult to see. But this is from one of my collaborators, Patrick Jung, who just had this paper accepted. And so with this work, he identified many, many, many different types of cyanobacteria from symbiotic systems. And so we think that there's a huge diversity out there. With cyanobacteria, they show significant morphological and physiological modifications in response to the symbiosis. So traditionally, they've been very difficult to classify, especially just based on morphology. But moving towards new molecular methods, they're starting to find novel species. And so Rizonema is just one example of this. And so the idea here is that symbiotic cyanobacteria are a source of novel species. With novel species, you have novel metabolism. And with novel metabolism, you have novel natural products. Unfortunately, the genome situation is not very diverse, I would say. So just in general with NCBI, we have just under 1% of all genomes are from cyanobacteria and about 31% of these are marine plecorococcus. You know, this is not very diverse as it is. When we look at specifically just symbiotic cyanobacteria, out of the just over 3,000 genomes, seven of them are from lichen symbionts. All of them are Nostoc, and six out of the seven were isolated from Iceland in a single study. So, you know, this is not very diverse. With Cycad symbionts, again, there's only seven. Also, these are all Nostoc, and the other remaining 19 genomes are just from all other sources. And so, you know, there's very, very poor genomic knowledge in this area. Sorry, I know this is a bit of a crazy table, but there's only some specific things to look at. So... The top seven genomes are from lichens, the bottom seven genomes are from cycads, and the main thing that I want you to see is that one out of the 14 genomes, only three of them are complete, and the rest of them are draft genomes. And with these draft genomes, there's many, many contigs, so they're not very high quality genomes. If we look at the total number of biosynthetic gene clusters from these organisms, one, they all have biosynthetic gene clusters, so this is a good start, and they all have quite a lot. However, it's important to keep in mind that these numbers could be artificially higher because when you have many contigs, you get many of the biosynthetic gene clusters which are cut in the middle of the contig, and so this can increase the number. However, there's still some there, so this is still important. When we look at the number of already characterized biosynthetic gene clusters, you know, they do have known pathways, but these are more pathways that are common throughout cyanobacteria. So for example, geosmin, heterocyst glycolipid biosynthesis, things like this. 
And lastly, when we look at the number of NLPS PKS, these are in general are about half the number of total pathways. And so while we have limited genome data, you know, this is a good example that there are many natural product pathways within these organisms. So with this in mind, you know, I started to talk to some people and to try and form a group together to investigate these further. And so one of the people that I've contacted is Michelle Geringer, which is an audience. And so uh, you heard her speak a few weeks ago. Some other people include Michael Lakatos and Patrick Young. And so they work on more biotechnology and isolating these bacteria from a range of environments. And Matthias Schultz and Maria Preto. And so they work specifically on evolutionary biology of lacanomycetes. And so these are a very specific type of lichen, which only forms symbiosis with cyanobacteria and with a very broad range of cyanobacteria. Our goal here to now provide high quality genomes that will have various applications for all of us. And so for me, I'll be interested in the bioactive natural products. And then the others will also use these genomes for their own research questions. With this, we were successful in getting a Joint Genome Institute CSP grant, and so this will sequence 40 cyanobacterial genomes that we have. I didn't want to list all the genomes, but just in general, they group like this. So we have some that are lichen symbionts from Australia, Germany, South Africa. These include Nostoc and non-Nostoc species. We have various cyanobacteria from the lichenomycetes, and these are all non-Nostocs. We have both Nostoc and Calatrix from various Australian cycads. And we have a few other terrestrial cyanobacteria that were isolated from extreme environments. And then in the future, you know, we hope to then also expand our sequencing efforts with a focus on these phylogenetically divergent cyanobacteria. And so with that, this brings me to the summary. And so, you know, going back to DIPAC, you know, I think it's very good for cloning these small to mid-sized clusters. It's very easy in vitro setup with cluster refactoring. And so it's my hope that DIPAC will enable further exploration of cryptic biosynthetic gene clusters, especially from cyanobacteria. If anyone is interested in using this method or think that it might be useful for them, then please contact me. I'm happy to help everyone and anyone and let me know. And lastly, just the acknowledgements. Uh, firstly, I'd like to thank, of course, Professor Gulda, who has been an absolutely amazing supervisor for me. Everyone from TU Munich who have now moved to the University of Leipzig. And of course, all the people that I work with in my symbiotic cyanobacteria little group. Thank you. If you have any questions, please let me know. <laughs>